So welcome back. Uh, I gauge by the uh, arrivals back in the room that the networking break was a huge success, but it's time to start our second panel for the day. And this panel is focused on soldier and family readiness. The theme of the panel is building resilient families within the strategic support area of multi-domain operations. And we have our very own Ms. Patty Barron, uh, our Director of Family Readiness for the, your Association of the United States Army, is the panel chair. And I will turn it over to Patty Barron. She is adorable, and please let her know that. Patty, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. I do appreciate that. <laughs> So hello everybody, my name again is Patty Barron and I am the director of AUSA's Family Readiness Division. Um, as a military spouse of an, of an active duty soldier for 30 years, I know that the health and well-being of our families is impacted by the many policies, programs, and services that are offered on Army installations. I myself have been the recipient of many of them, and now my son-in-law, my daughter, and my two adorable little granddaughters who are stationed at Schofield Barracks are also um, experiencing the support of, um, of many programs and initiatives. But 18 years of conflict and overseas missions and, and sequestration have taken their toll on the many programs we have come to rely on. New thinking, new options, new approaches are currently being offered or in the process of being reimagined. Change is coming, change is a necessity, and new thinking is the rule of the day. No one in this room knows this more than the people that you're about to meet and hear from. And I, for one, am very anxious to hear what they have to offer. And so I'm going to introduce our panelists, and, um, and then they'll go ahead and take it from there. So to my right, I have Mr. Paul Burke. Mr. Burke serves as the Director of Family um, and, excuse me, the Director of Family and Morale Welfare and Recreation Directorate, G9, Installation Management Command. In this capacity, Mr. Burke manages uh, the delivery of Army soldier and family programs, which support the readiness and resilience for soldiers and families and garrisons throughout the United States, the Europe, and the Pacific. Next to him is Colonel Steve Lewis. Colonel Steve uh, Lewis is the Chief Family Programs Branch and Department of the Army Family Advocacy Program Manager, Office of the Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management. He is responsible for the program development, guidance, and oversight for the Army Family Advocacy Program and Exceptional Family Member Program and, community, and Army Community Services. Then we have Brigadier General Shan Bagby. Brigadier General Bagby is the Deputy Chief of Staff for Support G146, the United States Army Medical Command and Chief of the United States Army Dental Corps. And last but certainly not least, we have Mrs. Krista Simpson Anderson. Krista is the wife of an active duty Green Beret, Master Sergeant Gus Anderson, and the Gold Star spouse of Green Beret Staff Sergeant Michael H. Simpson who passed away on the 1st of May in 2013 from wounds sustained in an IED attack in eastern Afghanistan. She is the mother of two boys, Michael and Gabriel. Krista co-founded The Unquiet Professional, providing healthy and empowering opportunities to surviving families, veterans, and their families. We are really excited and proud to have you all here, and Mr. Burke, we'll let you take it away. Um, thank you, Patty. Uh, I appreciate AUSA for inviting me, and, and I uh, look forward to a, a, a discussion associated with soldier and family programs. So the slide you see behind me is, is, is why we deliver the programs we deliver. Of course, everyone is aware of the special um, challenges in the military lifestyle, so the family and MWR programs in which we deliver um, through MCOM enable the soldier and family uni unity and um, uh, community resilience. FMWR programs provide that sense of community. So the installations that we've heard this morning are the platforms for readiness and, and FMWR provides support and services to um, help soldiers and their families um, with that uh, readiness that they need. FMWR programs and services are the f foundation of the Army culture. We provide unit cohesion. Um, I was talking earlier about, and someone mentioned that uh, we are all recruiters, right? So, so there was a comment that we are all recruiters. So, so you recruit the soldier and you retain the family. So it's all about retention. The programs and services that we provide to, um, in FMWR programs help with that uh, retention of the soldiers and their families and allows the soldiers and the families to focus on their mission. So as General Becker um, mentioned earlier on the previous panel, 
um, the new chief coming up says there's three things we need to focus on, right? It's health care, housing, and child care. So child care is one of the programs we deliver as part of the family programs portfolio. Child care allows the soldiers to go to training and not worry about their families. They can be deployed and know that their families are being taken care of through not only child care, but also the delivery of multiple programs that we deliver in FMWR. And then as, and the bottom bullet is we support all phases of the deployment cycle. So whether it's pre-deployment, you know, during deployment, post-deployment, Soldier and family programs that we deliver, whether it be from fitness to, to train the soldiers, to child care, which I mentioned, to, which allows the soldiers to not worry about the family. The, the programs we deliver in Army Community Services, financial readiness, allows for soldier and family resiliency. And the, then, you know, the post-deployment. It's how do you take the soldier that's been deployed and bring them back and reintegrate them back into the family? There's a number of programs that allow soldiers and their families to be reintegrated, redu you know, to, because when you've been gone for 12 months, reintegration, the family's moved on, the soldier has to reintegrate back into the family. How do you do that? First of all, you provide opportunities for um, the soldier that's been deployed to burn off some of that energy that they have. We have Warrior Adventure Crest at a number of installations that allow soldiers to um, participate in high energy activities to help relieve some of that stress and then we have a number of family programs that allow the um, families to come together and reintegrate recreate together um, and have the time to um, you know bring back into the family so um, having said that I will pass this on to Colonel Lewis and allow him to talk about um, his area Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Burke. And again, uh, Patty, I'd also like to thank you for uh, inviting us to a part of this uh, symposium. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Mr. Burke did steal my opening quote. You're right. We do recruit a soldier, but we reenlist a family every time. And that's really critical because in, when we think about the morale and welfare of soldiers and their, uh, you know, what maintains their will to fight when our nation's war, soldiers are really, or correction, the families are really critical to that uh, link, both for our active component as well as the reserve components, you know, and the, the, their ability to have access to programs and resources uh, is, is critical in allowing them to uh, maintain the home front. And when we think about what the future requires, uh, it's important for us to really uh, look sometimes through the lens of the past and be able to look at what we've learned from the la lessons from the past, and that helps us understand what those requirements may be for the future. We're, we're far removed from the frontier days where we just had camp followers, uh, but even at that period, it was commanders that were working together with those wives groups to, to establish sort of ad hoc uh, support for families and soldiers as those camp followers sort of followed their, their, their soldier around the, uh, the army. Then uh, as, we, as, as the Army continued to grow, we looked, uh, we looked in the community. It was charitable organizations and benevolence aid societies that came to the aid of our soldiers and families, especially because we didn't have the mechanism or the infrastructure to support those soldiers and families. And then uh, later on, it became formal command programs that were uh, established and identified, especially late in, in the early 80s when General Wickham, the Chief of Staff of the Army, focused his energy and his efforts on the uh, Army families because he recognized that being in the Army just isn't a job. It's truly an institution, and we've got a moral and ethical obligation to take care of our soldiers and their families, and he really redirected those policies onto families. And when we think about that landscape shifting from uh, just ad hoc organizations and charitable organizations to command, fam command spawn command-sponsored programs, there's been three sort of key elements that have, that have remained this similar and the same throughout that time. First, first of all, the strain on families has been pretty common, and as well as the, the challenges that families face remain fairly consistent and common. So we've got to look at you know, what those are. We're talking now about rotational forces. We're talking about, uh, again, the constant deployment rotations, as well as the, the strain on the reserve components and, and what that is. The second one is that the community is integral to the support for soldiers and families, and, and it's important for us to not forget that, you know, not only the community internal, that that is the soldier and family readiness group and the, and the command's uh, support of that, but then that extends outside of our installations, and, and, and as talked about before by Mr. Austin, it's that community that's supporting the uh, reserve component families that are, that, you know, are sometimes 
invisible in their communities, but their service is great and, and, and a tremendous sacrifice. And then the last and probably most important link there is that the commanders are critical to what we do for soldiers and families. They truly understand what their soldiers and families need. They understand what the resources are available to them, and they, they work in, in, in connecting those soldiers and families to those resources and being able to then communicate what those requirements are to their uh, leaders as well as up to the staff for us to be able to understand what the requirements are for our soldiers going forward. And we really do have some tremendous challenges. Everybody knows about 60% of our families, 60% of our soldiers have a family member, and that's on their mind. And those families are under, under stress. One in four uh, spouses are still looking for employment. They're unemployed and looking for work. We've got 40,000 exceptional family members. We've got uh, issues where financial security wreaks havoc on relationships and adds to issues of domestic violence. And we've got to ensure that our family programs are, are focused on those type of issues and concerns and that they're able to to connect people and uh, bring them together. So as we look to the future, we have to think about what makes soldiers and families resilient. And those are some of the real common things that we've got to look at. Connectedness. Social connectedness continues to be one of those uh, readiness factors that reinforces what uh, to help the soldiers and families. The second thing is they're problem solvers. We are a do-it-yourself uh, generation, right? I mean, Home Depot, do it right. Let's do it right. Let's get out doing it. So they want to have the skills and the, the technology and also the information available to help them problem solve, pro solve problems. But when the problem gets to a point where it's a uh, crisis, they want to be able to reach out and talk to somebody and engage somebody to help them resolve that problem. Then they're going to go back and do those things to be effective. So it's about healthy families, healthy activities. And then the last thing, they're 24-hour consumers of information. They are connected all the time. And we've got to be able to leverage that technology to keep these soldiers and families connected. And we've done things at Axum to help do that, whether it's the changes for soldier family readiness group, whether it's those uh, improvements in child care and ensuring that we've got uh, re predictable and access to that child care. And then it's also about access to additional resources, whether it's quality health care or um, quality family programming linking those things back to those families through technology, but also having a, a somebody to talk to will be critical for us to maintain that resilience. And I am just out of time. <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you, Colonel Lewis. So I'm gonna take a slightly different tack. So uh, Sean Bagby, on behalf of the uh, Army Surgeon General, very honored to be here. And what I'm gonna do is try, to t is try to paint a picture that highlights the intersectionality between the military health system, family readiness, <laughs> Uh, installation readiness and, and multi-domain uh, battle. So I, I think you all remember the, the previous Chief of Staff, General Odierno, said that the strength of the nation is the strength of the Army, the strength of the Army is the soldier, and then the strength of the soldier is the family. And as Colonel Lewis alluded to, um, about 60 percent of our soldiers have families. And if you look back at the greatest generation, 75 years ago, right, that was about 10 percent. So it hasn't always been that way. Um, Today, we have you know, folks that are married, mostly 60%, most have, most have children. And so these are the folks that we rely on, right, to, to go out and do multi-domain operations. So it's, vital, so it's vital that we, as, as military health system, maintain both the resiliency of the soldier and the resiliency of the family at every installation. So how are we doing that? We know that through studies um, that the families care most about three things. First, quality of housing second schools, and then third medical care. And we know that soldiers can't function in the crucible of, of combat if their minds are not focused on the mission, and so they shouldn't be preoccupied with the health and welfare of their families. Uh, likewise, the Army has to assure that, that the families that the soldier receives the highest quality of care, um, both forward, rear, and then at home station. And we know that a healthy soldier makes a healthy family, so it all comes together. Now. In terms of what we focus on in Army Medicine, we know that readiness begins with, a, with a, a fit and healthy fighting force as the strong foundation. So what we're doing is looking at improving individual readiness and deployability by strengthening our soldiers physically and cognitively, improving, improving uh, resiliency skills, and looking at unhealthy habits. And so what I'll do is I'll talk about a couple of a couple of issues, a couple of things that we're doing to get after that. So the first thing I'll talk about is the uh, new Army Combat Physical Fitness Test, or ACFT. So this test is a part of the changed approach, and it's based on some studies, the baseline soldier physical uh, readiness requirements and physical demand study. And in looking at 
outlining the, the uh, components of the ATF, ACFT, the Army determined that for in, in order for soldiers to be ready for the rigors of, of, of combat, they have to possess significant physical capacity in not only muscular strength and muscular endurance, which is what the legacy test is designed to test, but also um, speed, agility, balance, flexibility, coordination, and reaction time. And the studies show that the ACFT events correlate 80% uh, predictive with how someone will, will perform in combat versus the legacy test, which is 40% pre uh, predictive. Looking to roll this out with full implementation by October 2020. The next thing I'll talk about is the holistic health and fitness program. Uh, this program was begun in August of 2018 in coordination with Army Forces Command to advance the physical edge of our soldiers in combat. So our Army leaders recognize that similar, just like professional athletes, athletes, soldiers must train both body and mind to be optimally performing. So this program implements a vision for soldier performance through improved nutrition, sleep and recovery, <coughs> and mental toughness. And specifically, it, it pushes the team concept with physical and occupational therapists, strength coordinators, trainers, and dietitians. And the key here is they're actually embedded in the units with the soldiers. So they go with them to training. They're in their area. These are people that are assigned to them. And they build, they build a strong network uh, of trust in teams. So we think that this investment will ultimately improve our fitness culture, right, and improve readiness and increase physical toughness, toughness across the Army. Um, with regard to how this helps the installation and the family, you know, we're already seeing where, it's, where there's a cost savings, right? $1.6 billion potentially in, in savings due to not having lost productivity due to injury. And, and the, even the better benefit of that is that the family gets a, a more fit soldier, a more fit father, a more fit husband, wife, mother, daughter, so on and so forth. The next thing is going to be um, behavioral health, brain health, behavioral health. So the Army recognizes that cognitive and mental health are important aspects of promoting physical health. And the wars in the Middle East exposed our service members to blast injuries. Um, there's been extensive research funded by Congress. Now, to date, over $900 million has been provided for research since, since 2007. And we know that over 217,000 soldiers experienced TBIs, with the majority of those diagnosed in garrison. And so what we've done is made brain protection part of priority We've, in, we've in, uh, embedded behavioral health, um, made TBI and behavioral health part of, part of the whole exam. Um, I see I'm out of time, but I do want to highlight behavioral health. It's one of the most important factors that we believe in sustaining the readiness of the Army at, at our installations. So what we have, we call the behavioral health system of care. It's a comprehensive continuum of care with 11 standardized behavioral health clinical programs replicated across the Army. It supports the readiness of the force by identifying behavioral health issues early on in the course of illness, delivering evidence-based therapies, leveraging community resources, and monitoring efficiency. Likewise, um, the Army's developed programs with you know, embedded behavioral health in units, behavioral health in primary clinics, and also to help our family members school behavioral health. So with that, I see that I'm out of time. I look forward to your questions, and thank you for, for your attention. I think that means it's my turn. <laughs> Patty, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to, I guess, just start by telling you a little bit about my story so, um, so that maybe you'll understand kind of where, I, where I'm coming from and why I do what I do today. Um, in 2006, I met this, you know, handsome soldier. We married, we had a couple of kids, and I had zero military background. I had no, I mean, people say they had no idea. I had no idea what I was getting into, and I'm grateful that I got into it, but um, I had no idea. And so um, he actually, we got married, he went back to Germany, and, um, and we met back at, at Fort Bragg for the Special Forces Qualification course. And at the time, there was no fa family readiness for you know, for the schoolhouse. And so um, I think I had, my neighbor was a friend, a friend, I had one friend in Fort Bragg. And a couple years later, we headed out to Joint Base Lewis-McChord. 
and um, and started our journey. Well, um, in 2013, when Mike deployed with Fourth uh, Battalion Charlie Company, uh, you know. I'll never forget dropping him off at the company and just, you know, saying, all right, I'll see you later. You know, I mean, it was kind of like any other day. Again, I had no idea. I didn't really watch the news. I didn't, I didn't do any of that. I felt like for my, my mental health, it was really good for me not to do that. And, um, 20 days later, you know, I'm running down the stairs after putting our son Gabriel, who was one at the time, um, down for a nap and, it was a call from the company commander, and I had literally, you know, like, oh, hey, how you doing? I mean, why would the company commander be calling me from Afghanistan? Didn't even give it a thought. And um, and Mike had been injured. He had hit an IED um, while riding an ATV, coming back from a mission, trying to find a safe route. And um, at that moment, you know, uh, it shifted, right? As a mom, your kids are number one. You know, unfortunately, your husband's number two. <laughs> And, and, it, and it shifted, right? Then all of a sudden, Mike was number one. And so um, I was, I married late. I was 31. I'm an only child. I'm a little thick-headed, you know. I might be a little type A. And so when the, um, the battalion surgeon called and said, we're meeting at the company, you know, at 9 o'clock, um, and we'll call you and give you an update. I said, great, I'll be there at 9.30. <laughs> Mike was injured and hadn't passed, and he, they were working on him tirelessly. And so, um, fast forward, we would we would fly to Germany. Um, flying there, I knew that it it um, you know that he would come home to Dover. And um, but so such a blessing to be able to be with him out there. And all of these things that I've learned um, through that uh, experience, I have you know to date been able to pass on. It's not an easy conversation, right? I mean, people don't want to sit down and talk about what if we lose our spouse, whether you're civilian or you're military. But <clears throat> there's things that that I learned through that course, never mind the support of our community outside and inside the gate. I mean, it was just absolutely incredible, and that's why I founded The Unquiet Professional. And one of the, re one of the things that we focus on now is veterans, because over the past six years, I've realized that, you know, at the end of the day, Mike paid the final sacrifice. He did not pay the ultimate sacrifice, right? Our veterans that come home that suffer every single day, and their families suffer every single day. I could tell you stories that I'm sure you've all heard, or maybe haven't, you know, that they live with all of these, um, these wounds in silence. And that's why, you know, I would have let you go on and on about behavioral health because I'm a huge proponent. If anybody knows of a therapist, we've moved here in August. I'm still looking for one out in this area. But, um, and so, you know, for me, educating our spouses from day one is key on everything. Do you have a will? Have you gone through your DD-93 with your spouse? you know, with your soldier. Um, have these conversations. The worst thing that you could ever possibly feel is, oh my goodness, I have no idea what he would have wanted, right? So have the conversation. Um, and and we need, I think creating um, stronger and more informed and educated, oh, spouses, I'm out of time, but um, is, is the key. And that's one of the reasons why I started with Army Emergency Relief was to get to our spouses, inform them of the resources that are available, and, um, and allow them to kind of take control of their military spouse career. And I think, you know, troop readiness, we say, starts with family readiness, and family readiness starts with me as a spouse. And so that's my mission. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Krista. All of you just uh, have touched on so many important issues and points. Um, I think you read my mind, so thank you for reading my mind. Because if you think about the fact that 60% of our force is married, 60% of our force is married. That's, that's something that should be important to every single person in this room. Because what it also means is that by supporting that family, mm -hmm. we're retaining the all volunteer force. That's incredibly important. And so I wanted to go, um, I, was, I had 
questions that I asked the folks to send me, but I knew this was not going to be a shy audience at all, and you did not disappoint, so thank you very much. So I'm not going to go specifically to the questions that we had uh, that had been sent in, but I do want to get to some of the questions that were sent in by the audience uh, today, and each one of you has one, so that's always good as well. So Mr. Burke, I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to put you kind of on the spot a little bit. Uh, this one is about military children, and you mentioned that education, or maybe Colonel Lewis, you mentioned that education was one of the main things that our Army, fam or Army families worried about. When Army families move from location to location, children in grades, K through 12, have to restart their life in a new school and figure out how to adapt. How are we equipping sending and receiving schools uh, to help facilitate student transitions? So the, the schools that our kids are going from to the schools that are receiving our kids. How are we equipping them, and are you, do you guys have anything to do with, with that? Um, that's a good question, and the short answer is yes. So the Army a number of years ago recognized the stressors not only you know for the move, but for children. So you're moving, and you move from Texas to North Carolina, and then what are the requirements, curriculum requirements? Do they transfer? Do you have to take North Carolina history? All of these things. So the Army created... Um, positions called school liaison officers. We call them slows. Um, the slows allow the children, and, and we would do the handoff from one installation to the next installation saying, hey, you are having these fa uh, family members with these kids in these grades transfer to Fort Bragg. Are you, you should be ready to receive them and help them find, um, you know, the schools they need to go to, and then what uh, what are the criteria for what will transfer and what are new? So you, they have the military interstate um, compact associated with the transfer of credits between states, which makes it much easier because many states require, if you don't take North Carolina history, you can't graduate. So, you know, those are some of the things that were relieved because of the um, uniquenesses of the PCSing of uh, military children and the slows uh, which are the school liaison officers help with that transition on an individualized basis as Colonel Lewis brought up everybody's connected but when it gets to a point they want to talk to somebody so the human on the ground that we have to help with these students are the school liaison officers thank you very much perfect Colonel Lewis I have a hard question for you so ACS has lost most of its staffing over the last three to four years there's a big push to reduce or eliminate services and partner with local community or organizations outside the gate. Is the Army relooking the guidance for ACS services? Once we eliminate a, a, a service, it's very hard to reestablish it. Partnering doesn't always work in some locations. And I, I want to add to this question by also asking, do you feel that ACS will become the hub to connect family members to services outside the gate? Well, that, it, that is a difficult question, right? So, um, so I think that uh, first and foremost, what we have to recognize is that while the ACS uh, staff may have reduced, uh, the requirement to uh, deliver certain programs and elements of the programs uh, still remains. And we work with uh, close, very closely with Mr. Burke and his staff in uh, ensuring, you know, what are those statutory requirements that we have to deliver, and ensure that that we're, uh, you know, that we're resourcing those sufficiently so that they can deliver those re those really critical requirements. Uh, the second component of it is uh, that that while um you know, the, as I mentioned before, the community is is an integral part of this because they're while they may not replicate exactly what's being offered on the on the installation. We've got to remember this: seventy percent of our service members live off the installation, and so they are already accessing a lot of these resources off the installation as it is. And I think probably more importantly is that we start, you know, that we can use, for example, technology. And as you mentioned, sort of the ACS as the hub, we can use technology as well as uh, you know working with the ACS and through the ACS to, to, again, identify what those resources are and link those families as close to where they are. And, and, and when, when they're not available, let's look at some solutions that might uh, be able to support those, uh, the availability of those resources. Um, I, prior to coming to AXIM, I worked in the behavioral health community, and uh, sometimes we'd have shortages for behavioral health providers, but we leverage telebehavioral health as an opportunity to bring those uh, capabilities to installations where they may have some shortages 
shortages. And I think we have to, again, consider what are the technological ways that we, with which we're able to bring in capabilities or support for soldiers and families so that we can, so that we can really look at those those factors that make families resilient, whether it's connectedness, whether it is, you know, healthy families and, and promoting whether it's healthy parenting or or effective marriages and and or it's uh, you know, giving them the access to financial counselors so that they can really stabilize the home and, and be and, and be resourceful and, and take care of their family. So I think that um, you know, so I think it's part of a, a collaboration between AXIM and IMCOM and identifying what the resources and requirements are. And then, again, those commanders identifying what the requirements are to support their soldiers and families and make sure that we're putting what we need where we need it um, so to, to support the families. So, Colonel Lewis, good answer. Um, so I'm going to add on to that. Um, so. Everybody's heard that, um, you know, if you've been to West Point, West Point is unique. You've been to Wainwright, Wainwright is unique. So I agree. If you've been to one installation, you've been to one installation. Every, all the requirements at each installation is different. So when we take a look at reductions or reform or reshaping or whatever word you want to use associated with what we, are, we with, you know, funding being, um, reduced and what we're going to do to deliver services, we have to take a close look at the demographics. What are the needs on that particular installation? Because the needs at Fort Bragg are completely different than the needs at Redstone Arsenal, just as an example, because you got 1,300 military plus or minus at Redstone, and then you have a lot of military at Fort Bragg. So where do we focus the resources and the services we provide? We will provide levels of services comparable at almost every installation. It may not be a specialist, and it may be community partnerships in most cases, as Colonel Lewis brought up. They live off the installation, so they're likely receiving that service somewhere else. There will still be a person on an installation, even with the reductions they could go to, um, and then referral services that we can also obtain with the, through those partnerships. So really, it's the focus on where do we need to, um, you know, reallocate, reshape, where our um, workforce needs to be to provide the priority of services um, to soldiers and families. Those are two very excellent answers. And I would add, um, from the family perspective, something that you said, Colonel Lewis, that I think is incredibly important. What is the need of that particular family at that particular time? And matching that need to a resource that's going to address that need. Um, and uh, that leads me to uh, General Bagby. I'm going to give you the opportunity to go back to behavioral health because it's so important that, that, we, that we discuss it. There's so many pieces of it. I'm, I'm going to give you a, a quick example and then I'm going to ask you a question. The quick example is there's a military spouse that's feeling depressed and down and just isn't quite all there. She's got a toddler and she's got an infant at home and the infant was recently born. So she decides to go and get some support in, 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 um, in terms of um, counseling. But her counselor happens to be a non, a male who's not a parent and is not military. So that sense of understanding where that person is coming from is very limited. So what I'm going to ask you is, can you expand on, um, I'm sorry, uh, what programs are offered to help soldiers and families in a time of crisis, keeping in mind that young spouse that needs a particular type of support? Okay, well, in a time of crisis, we have numerous programs uh, where MedCom provides resources to assist soldiers and families. You mentioned, and I talked about behavioral health. Um, we want to ensure that people have the best access possible, the highest quality possible, and that the system supports the soldier and the family member when they need to be there. Um, we have folks on the installation, case care managers, uh, communicating with, se with senior leaders and across the services like the SLOWs and FAPS, and we have things like you know school-based behavioral health where we notice that the population for example, like at Joint Base Lewis-McChord, heavy uh, active duty population, a lot of people live off post, concentrations where we can, where we can have the most impact, uh, biggest bang for the buck if you were. So one of the things we do is that we partner with the chaplains, the medical teams, uh, at Army FAP, and um, a, big, a big focus is, is child abuse prevention, educating, prompt reporting. But in terms of, of the resources, I mean, 
we, we, just as you said, you know, it's based on requirements. Um, I'm not sure if you can give me a specific example that would be, that would be asked. So I think um, the, what, ends, what could happen was that perhaps behavioral health on the installation, mm -hmm. that office, wasn't the best place for that spouse to go to. But in talking to military one source, mm -hmm. perhaps, yeah. and explaining the situation, someone on the phone could say, there is a therapist, there is a counselor that's outside the gates yeah. that works with moms of very young children. Yeah. And so now you've got, and, and understands the military. So I, I, that's kind of what I was uh, thinking. I think that there's so much that's offered. And I know there's a yeah. shortage of behavioral health specialists to begin with, mm -hmm. But, um, but, but it seems like especially MedCom is trying to make those connections. So I, I think where, where we try to do well there is, is, the, is the partnership between FAP and MedCom, right, to be able to get that soldier family member to the right, to the point of care, the care that they need, not just care, but care that's relevant, timely, and meets their needs. And, and we try to do that every day. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Krista, uh, let me ask you a quick question. Um, and, and you've had some, you, you gave me some really wonderful ones. And so I'm gonna start with one of the ones that you gave me because I think they're important to the audience as well. What kind of resources do you think are important for spouses to know about? Do I have a time limit on this? <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting because it, a year ago, essentially, I became a part, a member of AUSA. I think that's huge, right? For me to be able to go on there or to receive the emails and to kind of see the bigger picture, as opposed to my husband just goes off and goes to work and I have no idea, right? The background, I have no idea what he's doing. Um, or I don't understand why. Why is he being deployed, you know, so often? Or why are there so many TDYs? Why are you going to Korea? Why are you, you know? And so um, to be able to really kind of educate myself and understand that, that's huge. Um, Army emergency relief, not just for emergencies. Um, you know, it's, there's scholarships, right? Between 19 and 20, there's, um, their, their budget for scholarships are $9 million, right? Um, for spouses now, it's rolling. So we get our kids together, we get our kids all set, we apply for the scholarships for them, and then we can apply kind of whenever, um, whenever we need to. Um, stuff that TRICARE doesn't cover. You know, I had a friend that, you know, TRICARE will cover a cranial helmet if it's due to a surgery that the child has had, but TRICARE won't cover a cranial helmet if it's going to prevent the surgery. <laughs> but Army Emergency Relief will help with that. Um, and a lot of it is obviously, and, and I, I was just talking earlier about how as you, um, as you connect with AER, um, yeah, there's things that you, that you go over, you go over your budget. Well, as a young family, you know, maybe you've never done a budget before and you have to in order to get the support, but then you recognize, you know, going forward, all of the things that you need to do to stay financially ready for your family. Um, and so, you know, they provide car seats. One thing that I'm super excited about, because we talked about the, you know, the under and unemployment of military spouses, the one, you know, one out of four, if you will. Um, and so AER just instituted a program where the Army will, will pay $500 every PCS. Well, AER will help whether it's a grant, a loan, or a combination of both, up to $2,500 each PCS. And so, I mean, that is incredible, because, I mean, each relicensing and certification is different. It costs different, depending on what field you're in. And so yeah. to be able to have that and institute it straight away, right, instead of getting settled, getting, you know, ready, and then saving money to try and and execute that. And so um, the CYS sports getting connected, you know, I wish, and I say this all the time, and, you know, oh, the command can't make the spouses come in to, you know, to briefings. They, we can't get them, you know, we're not allowed to, you know, force them to be engaged. I wish that would change, honestly. Because, you know, if you take your soldiers and you say, you know, look at this instead of a job, look at this as a, as a way of life. I mean, this is a, this is a lifestyle, right? You don't realize how much you need that community, that military community, until all of a sudden one day you get that phone call. And then you become, from a military spouse, you become a military widow, and then you're disconnected, right? And then what? Then you, then you don't have that connection. Then, then, then you know, you have to make 
the, you know, the journey back in. I ran back in. Don't worry. We're good. Um, <laughs> and as some people say, I, you know, <laughs> you didn't learn your lesson the, the first time. I married a, another Army uh, Green Beret. So um, with that, I, and again, I could go on and on about resources, but there's so many. And also make sure that they're relevant to you, right? If you're a ranger, Lead the Way is an incredible organization. If you're a Green Beret, I mean, Care Coalition works with spouses if you're special operations, but there's so many others out there um, as well, inside and off. And ACS is huge. Thank, thank you, Krista. Uh, Colonel Lewis, um, uh, uh, this, isn't, this is a question for you, but I'm going to make a general statement. Uh, a lot of times, um, the military families are kind of accused of living a 1950s lifestyle in that you know, we're, we're much more traditional than, than our civilian counterparts are because for a lot of different reasons. The, the many moves that we make make it very difficult for military spouses to, to gain employment and keep a career going. And, um, and in a two-career family uh, civ civilian community, which helps with financial readiness, obviously, and in a military community where, where that's not always possible, it can become very frustrating. But I know the Army's made great strides in this area. So my question to you is, um, uh, you mentioned that one in four spouses are out of work or looking for employment. Uh, what can be done to help these spouses? Uh, thank you. So, yeah, that um, so I, I appreciate it. Um, Ms. Simpson Anderson really spoke to one of the most critical things that's associated with family uh, and, and spouse employment. Uh, most recently, there has been a, um, a policy signed that that does allow the Army to reimburse uh, families that have professional certifications or licenses when the spouse moves uh, or the the soldier pays CSs in the fam spouse PCS with them, that they, they can get reimbursed for that license. As a professional social worker, I see that, you know, every year that, that license comes back up. And, and for other family members that have professional licenses and or certifications, this is really helpful for them because it really offsets that. But sort of tied in with that also, uh, one of the things that we've got to continue to look at is uh, that portability of license because I may still transition to another state, but then that state is sort of similar, like Mr. Burke said, for schools, if you didn't take history of North Carolina, you may not graduate, but same with those states is making sure that there's a, a better reciprocity for license portability so that it, it, no matter what state I'm moving to, that my license is able to be uh, accepted and, and by that new state without additional excessive additional requirements that would delay my, my work. Uh, the next part is, uh, that's one, that's two. The third thing I think that's really important again, and, I, and this is, uh, I think that Mr. Austin spoke a little bit about this as well as General Becker previously, it's about that, uh, that command again, engaging with those community partners uh, to really reinforce what the tremendous skills that our Army spouses are bringing to the installation and to that, to that area and to support their employment. You know, Sometimes employers are a little reticent to hire a spouse because they know, oh, they may only be here two or three years. I don't want to invest in that human capital. But let's look at all of the tremendous skills that our spouses bring every time they move there, the, the, you know, from the household management to, to the frequent deployments and being able to really manage a, a, a full budget plus kids plus uh, all that goes with that. Um, they're, they're, they're certified sometimes and have specialty training. And for employers to recognize that, that we are bringing, you know, this spouse and this family it has tremendous skills and can bring a lot to that agency and organization, uh, and they really are missing the boat if they pass over that uh, military spouse because they may not be there the whole time and really accept recognizing we've got some tremendous talent and human capital and, and those commanders working with those community partners to re really reinforce that that message that we're bringing not only the soldier to your community but we're bringing their family and they, they're bringing some some great knowledge and skills to it so that's a third part the fourth part um, you know there's been th some things that also been helpful that have been put in place whether that is uh, we've we've done some things in child and youth services to speed up the hiring so that we can bring on uh, spouses into the child youth services, uh, shorten the time about by 15 days of hiring just to uh, get, you know, by, by, by bringing them on at right after FBI fingerprinting is done. There are, um, there's the Child and Youth Service Employment Application Tool, which really allows for the portability of one's uh, skills from work, working as a program assistant, child and youth program assistant at, at Camp Post Station A. When they PCS, they're able to sign in and, and, and sign up for that. So when they go to that next assignment, they already have the ability to not compete for a job, but get into that uh, child and youth services, and which is helpful too, because 
when we get staff in child youth services, we're able to maintain the, the full capacity of our child uh, CDCs and child service centers, and uh, therefore reducing wait lists, and, and that soldier has that access to that child care, and their family has access to child care. So that, that's a couple things, and I'm, I had one more on the top of my head, and I, I apologize, I'm forgetting it, but I think the, uh, the real criticality here is that, you know, there's, some, there's been some really great gains made both at the DOD level as well as at the Army level, um, but but uh, and then finally, I guess at the local installation level, we've got within ACS employment readiness programs, and those employment readiness uh, program coordinators and those counselors, they're they're the link to back to that committee. They're engaged with those local hiring partners and bringing them onto the installation to have job fairs and communicating back out to those commanders about the importance of hey, I've got this job fair going on. Let's try to match uh, the spouse preference to their um, to what what opportunities might be available for them, and they can continue to tell that story about we've got these family members with great skills let's get them into the workforce locally in that community and help help that soldier and family be uh, financially secure and stable and as Krista mentioned there's scholarships the DOD has my career advancement uh, which uh, pays for sort for programs that lead to a professional certification up to uh, four thousand uh, dollars so there, there there are opportunities abound I think it's just really again connecting that that family and that soldier back to uh, you know I think it begins in AC with our employment readiness programs, but also uh, through other um, DOD level as well as uh, Army level initiatives. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for bringing up the child care uh, providers because I think that what the Army is doing is incredible in that they're elevating that, especially that family child care home to, to an entrepreneurship level, right? Something that you can be proud of. This is your business. Here are the skills that we're going to give you. It's not just about child care, but it's about building your entrepreneurial biz, uh, skills, which is really exciting. Um, General Bagby, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to read it word for word because I don't understand the acronyms. So <laughs> hopefully you will. What is the TTPEG's plan to resource facilities to train and administer the new PT test? Did that make sense? So the training program execution group, right, which is part of programming, planning, budgeting, and execution. I presume that's what they're asking about. And that that is not within my portfolio, so I don't have a good answer for that. Those are still being developed, just like they're still working through, you know, will there be alternate events? The, the whole thing hasn't been worked through yet, but that's, I, I understand from senior army leaders that there's more to follow. Then let me ask you a follow on. Um, are, the, uh, are the army wellness centers part of what MedCom looks at? The Army, yes. yes. So this question is, uh, what is the Army's plan for the Army Wellness Centers? Well, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, they say that those who, you know, live by the crystal ball eat a lot of glass. I, I know that the senior Army leaders are, you know, it, it is something that we want to maintain and sustain because, it, it, in fact, I think that there's interest in expanding it. But, again, scope, scale, funding, those kinds of things will be worked out. Thank you. Thank you. And this is for uh, the three gentlemen here at the table. Um, how are all of these programs that you've listed currently uh, currently integrated and managed? Basically, they're looking for metrics. Are the in integration metrics? And the metrics uh, we measure. Uh, it, the easy part is the outputs. So we can measure, you know, how many people come in the door, what, you know, how much revenue, how many children we watch. The hard part is the outcomes. What did the program that we deliver at the installation actually do as it was designed to do? We say we think it does. We are we're comfortable and to say it does, but it's a variety of things brought together that really probably because everybody's resiliency or needs or requirements is individualized. So just because I have a need doesn't mean that, you know, Steve here does, has the same need or his family has the same needs. So we have to tailor those needs and requirements associated with it. So we have systems that, that track the case management associated with people who come and visit our centers. So we, we can develop trends associated with what is the 
family need, whether it be from a child care perspective, whether it's the perspective on in MWR programs, what, what programs do they frequently use and what can we deliver more of and then see how many people want to participate that and of course in ACS programs. So we have a number of systems that um, the Army Family Programs web portal which is how we do the tracking and management of all of our ACS programs. We partner with Military One Source associated with putting information out there for the digital age of family. So there's a number of systems that we use associated with capturing data to make sure that we're meeting the demands that the folks that come to our facilities need. And then it's a matter of, you know, have we made a difference associated with those delivery of services? I think her, the previous panel had that question in terms of, you know, what's the one thing that keeps you up at night? And I, and I would say that, you know, family programs, I, I will say, are, are critical, and they are really critical to what we do. And the ability for us to operationalize the family program delivery and then link that back to the metric of readiness uh, so that we can then demonstrate to the uh, Army senior leaders as well as the um, – the, the, the folks on the Hill that, yes, our family programs are making a difference um, for soldiers and families and improving their readiness and improving their resilience. And, and the more that we can take both the, the sort of the demand signature data as well as continue to look at where, what, how can we measure family readiness and soldier readiness whether uh, and, and show that our family programs have made an impact, therefore ha can have a priority in funding or at least ensure that that, that funding and that resourcing continues uh, is, is really, I think, one of my the things that I think is really critical. This is the one thing that keeps me up at night because I, I agree with uh, Paul that uh, we've got really good data to show us what that demand signature is, an idea of, of what, what the requirements may need. But uh, again, being able to ultimately link it back to readiness is critical. And, and I think tied in with that as well is that we make sure that we uh, are helping to build decision support tools for the senior commanders, uh, for them to be able to uh, make those really important uh, sort of priorities decisions about where to put their resources for family programs. Because as we're able to put in place those decision support tools for those senior commanders, that will help them exponentially in, in ensuring that then the resource, the right resources are aligned against the concerns and uh, needs of those families. So that's why commanders are so important to this as well. So speaking from an Army medicine perspective, um, I'll, I'll say it two ways. So from a technical perspective, we have tons of ways of measuring what we do, point of care, how many visits, what was produced. Um, I think to, to your point, I think one of the things that, that – um, we probably could improve and I think we, we need to look at is, is that care relevant, right? We, we don't necessarily measure the frustration index of, of accessing what for most people is a quality system, but knowing how to access it, I think sometimes, which, which portal, who do you talk to, you know, who to, who to turn to when the system doesn't quite fit your specific need. Right? That's something we really don't have a mechanism to measure, but I think it's something we're trying to get after. We do very well at, at we know about soldier readiness, but, but in terms of family readiness, I'm not sure we have the metrics there. Just being very transparent. They, go ahead, Krista. I think with that too, um, back to you know, my point on educating the spouses in the very beginning, right? Um, however that can happen, um, because when you, are taking on something and you're struggling in your family, you know, I mean, jumping into military one source and trying to find your, you know, find your resources um, can just be overwhelming, right? Um, and trying to find that, that direct contact can be overwhelming because you're already drowning, right? So you're not thinking clearly. But if you're aware of it, when you are thinking clearly in the very beginning, then you already have that toolbox and you know, oh my goodness, okay, I'm starting to become depressed or I have postpartum depression or my husband's been gone and, um, and you know, I, I, need some, I need some help navigating this. And you know exactly who to call and when to call them. So. 
I'd like to build on that, what Ms. Anderson said. So recently, uh, we, we published policy or change to the Soldier and Family Readiness Group. And if, if you look at the policy, it's been a pretty, it's a pretty significant paradigm shift for Soldier and Family Readiness Groups in so much that we're, we're shifting a, a sort of away from this idea that SFRG is about social activities and fundraising. And it's much more about just creating a network of communication and support for families uh, and soldiers. And, and I think that's really key to the education component that Mrs. Anderson describes. And, and we start looking at, so what are the measures of success for our soldier and family readiness groups going forward? And for me, and what we're continuing to develop and build our, you know, how the, the connectedness and are they informing and engaging with these with these family members and how frequently are they communicating and informing them about availability of resources and support and what those are and and really ultimately allowing uh, creating a network so that when there is a concern and the family member needs some information that they know where to go or they know whom to contact to get that information and support uh, because again they the the research shows that they they really do like to sort of do it themselves and they I mean that's what our information technology does a lot for us. I mean, two weeks ago, I didn't know how to repair a pool pump, but I got on YouTube and I repaired a pool pump and I fixed my pool pump down in San Antonio because I, I like to do it myself. I mean, and that's sort of how, and, and our family members like to be problem solvers, but when they don't know how to solve the problem, that that SFRG is going to be, needs to be that linkage between the command and the, avail, the resources available to those commanders and to that, to that family member. And if you don't mind, if I can just dovetail on, on, in your comments too, I think that one of the things that we're also looking at is, is, you know, so we have all these wonderful programs. We have things in place to help the soldier. It, it's the communication strategy and, and the balance between security and availability and then trying to figure out how to reach millennials because that, that's who we're trying to reach and using social media and things like that to get the word out. I don't know if you have any suggestions or thoughts about that. If you, sorry, I don't mean to hijack, but. I think I'm on the cusp of, you know, the technology still, I, I'm not ready to jump in, right, full force. <laughs> I'd like to use my word processor, but I am a spell check kid, you know. Um, but one of the things that, um, that we did at AAR, um, which is, I think, super simple and can connect with anybody, is we created these wallet cards Right, and on here you can write your FRG leader, your unit chaplain, um, unit chain of command, Army Community Service, and AER local officer, um, their phone numbers, right? And you just keep it in your wallet. And it has some tips on here, uh, emergency, you know, what AER provides. But, you know, it's interesting because um, one of our senior spouses pulled out when I was talking about it, and she pulled out one that she had had for 15 years that she had information on. And even if it's not in the forefront of your mind, you wanna just, every single time they open their wallet and they look at that, they go, somebody's got my back. Or I know who to contact. Or in the case, in a situation where there's an emergency, I know. And I think the chaplaincy program and your strong bonds, and I know that there's been changes and everything, but you know, if we bring back in faith and family, I mean, we could be a force that no one could reckon with, you know, I mean, and so I think, and it would create stronger families as well. So that's my. Uh, this is great because it kind of, uh, there's another question that kind of is a, a part of all of this. And um, I think Colonel Lewis, I wrote down what you said because it was so brilliant. I, <laughs> so your brilliant comments, I wrote them down. You talked about social connectedness, problem solvers, and that there's 24 hour, uh, uh, connecting us to information, right? That's the world that we live in. And so this question is about technology and you've all touched upon it a, a little bit. What technologies or innovations are needed to improve family quality of life? Because I think it's, I love the, the, the hard copy, if you will, card that you put in your wallet. We can't forget that. That's incredibly important. But there's also the technology that needs to, to happen to be updated. So uh, anybody can jump in on this question. Well, I'll start Be, well, where General Becker had mentioned. So the command is, is struggling with the technology aspect as far as security because we all suspect that the next attack is not going to be necessarily a uh, physical attack, but it'll be a digital attack on the infrastructure, on our systems, our security. And 
depending on the data we capture, requires a certain level of security. So if you're collecting PII, HIPAA data, those type of things, then you know you need more security. So at at you know currently, um, you know so the command struggling with getting security for all the systems that we've all talked about. Um, you know one thing that we are looking at in general. Becker has asked us to partner with APHIS because APHIS is, uh, is a partner on the installation as well, Army Air Force Exchange Services. Um, they, they, they write a commercial network. So there's a little different uh, requirements on a commercial network, but they're developing an app. And in this app, and I think uh, Ms. Anderson had mentioned it, you know, we're all an app society. So pull up an, you know, an app to find this, to find that. So APHIS is developing um, an app to, to give the installation footprint. So they're going to use the GIS technology to be able to go in and, you know, track your location. Where it, what is it that you're looking for? ACS centers, hours of operation, those type of things. I think that's a step in the right direction. I think until we can solve the, the requirements for the security and accreditation on the military side, we may have to do more partnerships with like APHIS that can do things um, from a commercial network side and still put the necessary um, security parameters around that information. So that's my thought. And 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 I, th I think I remember seeing in the agenda there was going to be some discussion later today on installations of the future, and I think that may be part of it. But I think that, um, again, sort of similar to what Mr. Burke was saying and, and from the beginning, the um, – the ability to, to, to continue to know where to get resources and how to get resources and, and, and the commanders being able to communicate frequently with the family members uh, and, and in a way that, 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 that engages them and, and brings them in to recognize that they are just part of this community. And we oftentimes think of the active side, but more importantly on the reserve component side, I, I think that technology is going to have a, a much more important role for our reserve components because they are, you know, they are in that community already and, and, and sometimes very remote from their supported command. They might be uh, in Indiana and the, the, the unit that they would drill with might be in the next state over and uh, Ohio or something like that, and for them to be able to uh, remain connected to that organization, but also then in in our in our community, in our in our state, and community partners and civic partners to also make sure that they know what resources are available for them and and how to engage and connect to those resources locally, I think is just as important because we can you know that, so we got to think we always got to think outside the gates as well. So again, speaking from a military medical perspective, in terms of quality and access, there are already partnerships with you know, things like Joint Commission, National Quality and Safety Center, where we can show the quality of care and the access that Army Medicine provides right, to the soldiers and families. Um, and again, some of these, actually most of them are publicly available, but it's getting that information in the hands right, of the individual that wants it. Is, is where I think we're, we're trying to get better. Use me, please. <laughs> <laughs> Any way you need to. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is, th because there is so much out there. You know, I just learned the other day that Military One Source vetted 9,000 non-governmental organizations and nonprofits and services. 9,000. I mean, they've gone through. I mean, I always said it would be amazing to have, I mean, they have these big IT conferences, why, you know, in Vegas, why can't we have one that, you know, supports the, every single individual, every single organization that supports the military, and we could just kind of go around and figure out what fits our, you know, what fits our space. But um, I think the hard part is, is that, you know, as, like I said, I'm, you know, I love this, but then I need this too, right? I, I mean, I, I need them both. Um, I'm not quite all techno you know technology um, and so yeah figure out what's really important for our spouses and our families to know um, pull that together and then start teaching from the very beginning and if you can pass something that's that makes those spouses attend like a brief in the beginning forces them to do it I will I will sign that petition a <laughs> hundred million times <laughs> 
And this will be the last question that I ask before we go to closing remarks from each one of the panelists. And I'm going to combine um, three questions because they're all asking basically the same thing. How do we reach out to male spouses, Gold Star families, and also to single soldiers? Because they're all a part of the fabric of our Army families. And so if anybody has um, already thought about how to do that or you have a wonderful thought of, I wish we could do it this way, we'd like to hear it. I'll start. Oh, no, no, go no, ahead, no, sir, no, please. I know. <laughs> um, you know, uh, male spouses, it's hard. I mean, I think it's hard because, I mean, there's, they're the minority, I guess, in our, in our spouse community. Um, but really encouraging them to kind of, to, to get involved and, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to think on that some more and I'm going to, formulate a plan for sure. Um, as for our gold star and our surviving families, you know, one of the things that I think is important to do is, um, you know, we tell them you'll always be a part of our family, but then it's really hard to look at them, right? It's hard, it's hard to bring them in and it's really uncomfortable because you have events, whether it's Easter or Christmas and you're having all these events on, on base and you're trying to be really sensitive to them because their soldiers are no longer here. But then you need to serve your, your soldiers and their families that are here. We need to try and make it less awkward and just be transparent and say, listen, we want you a part of this community. It's not always gonna be relevant to you, but we want you still here, right? Not every event needs to be in a memorial. I mean, the, you know, thank you for the sacrifice. Thank, you know, we acknowledge your service member. We acknowledge your, fa you know, your family. Not every event needs to be a memorial because then it just, I think it, it, it makes it where, where people just feel uncomfortable and they don't want the, you know, the two, the two spaces kind of coming together. Um, and then single soldiers. Oh my goodness. Um, Hmm. I'm going to have to, I'm going to let you take over that one. So <laughs> I let me have help some you ideas, with that, but. <laughs> um, um, Ms. Anderson. Um, so um, it, it really, be, unit, unit leadership is a key to getting to single soldiers. Um, but also there's a program, the Better Opportunities for Single Soldiers, which is BOSS. It's an a acronym that we have in um, MCOM. Um, we're having our annual BOSS conference next month in Indianapolis. Um, be bringing in all of the boss reps from worldwide together to to figure out better ways to communicate with the single soldiers because the boss program is older than most of the soldiers we're reaching out to now so we need to reform it reshape it and modernize it to to be something that's um, you know not your 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 dad's boss program when he joined the military so um, that's the program that we will be using besides the unit leadership which should be directly involved in a soldier's life then it's also you know um, the um, each other and bringing them together through the boss program so um, yeah I think one of the uh, the things that uh, uh, is important to remember is that we talked earlier about work-life balance and um, in, in that life space uh, soldiers single male uh, or, or spouses uh, male or female they all have these common interests I mean they may have some common interests that may not be specifically linked within somebody else in that unit but being able to uh, ensure that we've got uh, forums and venues like boss or even at through the SFRG where we're able to identify what those commonalities are and then bring them together based on sometimes just on those commonalities we have we share obviously a unit affiliation that we belong to but um, you know if you really start surveilling and we continue to look at what people are interested in what they how they spend their time uh, th we find out that they actually are engaging uh, sometimes with maybe other soldiers and other families but they're engaging with people based on these shared interests and commonalities I mean uh, you know through Facebook you have how many meetups I, I 
don't even know how many I could probably punch in, but you, know, you have hiking meetups, you have day, you know, child care meetups. You've got all these ways with which to 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 come together to to really engage and become engaged. And so I think it's at the commander level of uh, understanding again, uh, really knowing your soldiers and your families and what really makes them tick. Uh, and trying to link them up with somebody. And, and we also find out then that uh, that they might have something that's really unique that might be beneficial to other family members. We might find out that, uh, you know, Miss Ms., uh, Simpson-Anderson is uh, also a bookkeeper. And so, you know, hey, it's coming, uh, you know, and by the way, we're having some, let's do some financial education, and she can really bring in sort of her real-world example of, and this is how we manage the budget because I'm a bit type A. I'm not saying you are necessarily the bookkeeper type A, but that may be something. <laughs> that again brings people and engages them so let's find uh, those shared interests and those commonalities and that reinforces that connectedness okay well we come to the end of our time so I'm gonna um, ask each one of you to give us some closing remarks um, and Krista we'll start with you so I've got so many notes here so I'm just gonna try and breeze through a couple of things um, Another resource that I wanted to mention is Keeper Security. Um, it's a, it's, it's just an app, and I'm sure there's many out there, but it's a cloud-based, and my husband and I keep all of our username and passwords on it, and it's encrypted. He's checked it, trust me. And um, <laughs> he made sure that it was safe. But, you know, um, six years ago, I, I realized that, that Mike, my late husband, had a um, Chase um, bank account, and they wouldn't let me close it because you know the death certificate and the DD-1300 wasn't enough, the casualty report, and the, you know, my, of course my um, power of attorney <laughs> had expired once he died. And so I could pay the $4 balance, but I couldn't close it. And they're like, well, if you have his username and password, you can just go online and close it. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And to this day, I still actually um, plug in his phone every once in a while to see if he's got any emails <laughs> that I need to worry about. And so you know, we just talk about making sure that um, have access and I was just talking to somebody earlier and she said, well, you know, I'm not married and I'm, and you know, I'm single. Well, even a greater, you know, need for that, because if you've got, you know, um, uncle Joe who needs to come in and in the event of your death, how is he going to know what accounts you have, where they are and how to close them, you know? And so whether you keep that in your, you know, um, in your legal documents, you know, and and I don't want to talk about death the whole entire time, of course, but, you know, just kind of preparing yourself and making life easier, not only, you know, for you today and feeling secure about what's going to, you know, what could happen in the future, but for your family in the event that something happens to you. Um, you know, educating our spouses um, to care for their soldiers, um, you know, for in the reintegration process, I think is key. You know, it's so easy to say, tag, you're it. I've been taking their, care of these kids for the last six months, and, you know, it's your turn. I'm going to get a, you know, a pedicure somewhere. <laughs> I need some time, or I'm going on a vacation. But, we, you know, if they're more aware of what's happening, you know, um, on their deployments, you know, that in – and, and really feel vested into into caring for them, aware of the signs to look for before it's too late. You know, uh, talking about those and keeping those lines of communication open with our spouses. Is this my whole time? Yeah, no, we, we, you can wrap, I mean, oh, okay. this is our right. whole time. That's this it, is that's our it. Whole time. Um, so reintegration, you know, just, okay. All right, sorry, I thought that was my whole time. Ooh, sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm happy to help any anything y'all need. Thanks. So on behalf of the Army Surgeon General, I just want to say thanks. Appreciate the opportunity to participate today. Uh, Army Medicine continues to be committed to providing full spectrum care, battlefield to home station, soldiers and families. We've been doing so since 1775 and we'll continue to support the Army and support the Army families. Thank you. Um, again, I want to thank you again for giving us the opportunity on the panel. And, uh, you know, I think it goes back to, you know, we, the, the Army is, is, consists of people, and, and we are in the business of people until we have cyborgs on the battlefield, which I, you know, that don't know when that'll be, but uh, we've got to make sure that we're investing in people. And when uh, soldiers and families are in crisis, they want to be able to reach out and talk to somebody and, and have that helping hand or that shoulder to cry. And that's really, look at the genesis of ACS. It was built around, let's bring together all these disparate social service agencies into one under one umbrella to link them, coordinate, synchronize, 
reduce over some of the, the overlap so that we can really deliver those services. So I think as long as we continue to look at the ACS and the CYSS and MWR to, to be that resource and that hub to link people to the, what they need and what their interests are, we can be successful in helping people. Again, I'd like to thank AUSA, Patty, for um, asking me to come speak here. I appreciate all the questions we got today. So um, someone said you're all, all of you are recruiters. You're, all, you're also promoters, right? You can promote these programs, get the word out. We've talked about a lot of different venues, technologies, opportunities. It's just a matter of, you know, that, you know, everybody's doing their own thing, and it's a matter of, you know, what is it that the individual needs and to – to point them to those needs. And there's not one thing that'll be the, that'll solve everybody's um, stress or give them resilience. It's a multitude of things. So I think we talked about today a delivery of multiple programs, and that's what it's gonna take. It's a multi-pronged approach to get at the unique lifestyle that we have in the military. Again, thank you. Thank you all so much, and I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I'm the moderator, so I'm going to have the last word, if you don't mind, and I'm going to speak from the heart of an Army family member. We all married a warfighter. We understand what that means. We really, truly do, and we know that there are things that have to happen to make sure that that warfighter is trained, equipped, and ready to fight our nation's battles. What we ask for is we ask for information that can be counted on. We ask for transparency. Let us know what's going on as much as you can. And then the last thing that I would ask is that when a garrison commander says, I have an open door policy, that it is an open door policy. It is not a, did you talk to all these people before you came to me? I think that's incredibly important too. You all have been an amazing panel, wonderful information. We're very, very lucky to have folks like you uh, looking out for our Army families and Krista to have, a, have you as a member of our Army family. So thank you all very much. And I think it's time for lunch, but General McQuishan will let us know. <laughs>